friend of the five. I see also my friend Dragan, who is the head of uh, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Federation here for the region. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, your excellencies, one to one, one to one, is that correct? Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today. I'm, I'm pleased and also honored. Um, not only I'm honored to be with you and spending <coughs> a few minutes, hours, I hope, together, but it's also a moment which is an important moment. We feel, you feel, you said that, Dr. Faisal, that the world is changing, is changing fast, and we all, wherever, whatever the organization we are working with, are slightly overwhelmed by what is happening. So it's a time to recognize that we don't have all the response. So it's a time maybe to recognize that there is a need to try to understand what's happening. Try also to ask ourselves the right question. And to do so, it's extremely critical that we do that together with a different perspective. And I must say I'm very happy to be to being able to do that together with you here in Kuala Lumpur. When I see what your country has done, has achieved, but also the challenge of your country in the years to come. Your country will be sitting at the Security Council. Your country will chair ASEAN. You will play an extremely important role in the years to come. So asking the right questions, understanding what will happen, is more critical than ever. What I would like to focus on is to try to understand what might define, possibly, the role of humanitarian actors. And I believe so will also impact not only humanitarian actors, but I think all of you, being diplomats, private sectors, um, wherever your position are, I think I will try to understand that. And what I would like to propose you, as you said, Dr. Faisal, is one perspective. It's one perspective. There might be different perspective, and my perspective is the perspective of uh, the organization I'm leading, the International Committee of the Red Cross. It's an organization, as you know, would which is present in 84 countries. We are now 14,000 professionals. We work mainly in armed conflict, in war situation, or in extreme situation of violence or human crisis, very closely with our colleagues from the Red Cross, Red Crescent, but also some partners like Mercy Malaysia. So this is this perspective I would like to bring to your attention. And I will first look at what are the four or five possible features driver who might influence our role in the world in the months and years to come and I will try then to define what possibly are some way way forward. So the first feature really the first driver and again it was mentioned this morning is the fact that we are all facing <coughs> complex emergencies, complex situations. There's not one single problem anymore. It doesn't happen. Constantly when you are dealing with the humanitarian needs of people, what you see is a multitude of different element of needs. You can see that people are under pressure, and the pressure is multiple. Let me take a few examples. Ebola today. When you look at the work done by our colleague of the Federation of the Red Cross Red Crescent, my colleagues of the Red Cross Red Crescent, but also MSF, for example, or some state in Ebola, you would immediately understand that there is an issue about epidemic, so a very classical classical medical issues, but there is also a very important social issue. It's in a country, the three countries affected by Ebola right now, Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea, are countries which have gone through over the last two decades, very, very difficult time. War, violence, major economic issues, major poverty problems, development issues. So when you're dealing with a, a problem like Ebola, you don't only have a, to have a medical response, but immediately you have to understand what are the social problems from day one. And this is what we are facing everywhere. Look at Gaza. Look at Palestine, what's happening right now. It's now 40, 50 years of a crisis. When would you imagine, when is the, when is the emergency starting, when is it finishing? It's constantly emergency for the people. They are under pressure. It will continue to be so. And it's multiple pressure. It's violence, it's occupation, but it's also at the same time, clearly, poverty, issues in terms of education, bad governance. That's what they're facing. Look at Bangui, Central African Republic. 
Again a crisis, again pressure. <coughs> if you look at the history of Central African Republic, the last 20 years have been so difficult, so complicated. You remember uh, uh, the Emperor Bokassa? Yes, that was him, right? And we, if you look at what happens in this country and the price now the people have to pay, 20 years later, you can see it goes on. So, complex issue, complex need. We don't deal anymore with one issue at a time. We have to deal with several issues together. And it's this complexity, the fact that there is multiple pressure, which makes it so complicated. My second point is, and I would be happy to have your view on that one, is I do feel, we feel deeply at the ICRC that we are in a time where the political landscape is changing radically, or is transforming itself. And frankly, we don't know where it's going. It's a transition time, possibly. The question is how long transition will last. And what we see right now is there is just a lack, if not zero, international convergence between key states to deal with conflict, for example, but also to deal with climate change, to deal with migration. And all these problems are global. Cannot have a response from one state or even a region. You have to have a global response to that. We see a lack of convergence, a lack of common interest. We see polarization along ethnic lines, religious lines. And we see that not only internationally, but we see that in a lot of countries around the world. Here in this region, but also in the Middle East, in Africa, in Europe. So lack of convergence has an impact. Has an impact typically on Syria, as an example. I will announce you, and I'm sorry, I hope I'm wrong. I can tell you the war in Syria will last. Look carefully. It will last for the next years. Why? Not because of the humanitarian issue, it's a terrible issue, but because there's just a lack of international convergence to deal with the question. The Security Council of the UN, which is a reflection of this lack of governance, has not been in a position to really make a difference when it comes to Syria. It will be a big challenge for your country, and for all of us to be able to do so in the years now. So yes, as a humanitarian organization, we feel it. We feel this very strongly. And we also feel that possibly in the years to come, there is less space for consensus, for compromise, for moderate, moderator, facilitator. And here there is a role to play also for Malaysia, possibly as a country, to find the space to be able to do so. A lot to do. The third feature is the fact that we are, and some of you mentioned that this morning, but if I said it was you talking about that, we are living in a world which is at the same time incredibly connected because of the new technologies, everywhere, where, whatever the communities, and at the same time, fragmented, like never has been that fragmented. And this is the combination of the two, the connections and the fragmentation, which makes it so complex and so difficult to deal with. The connection is very well understood. I mean, you can see new media, and we see that. You can see in terms of generation that the mere notion of community that we know well, a physical community, you own this community, you're part of it, be, in, be aware that the new generation, they do not perceive community and they don't read community at all the same way. They have connected differently, their community is out there with them. I feel that at the ICSC also, a new generation of delegates, of ICSC delegates, when they come, they come with their community, they work together, you know, uh, it's interesting. How, what does that mean? So the mere notion of community is changing. We have to adapt that, to come to understand, to try to, to capture what, what he's saying. And at the same time, an incredible fragmented environment. Very fragmented. And there are several reasons for that. One of the reasons is it's possible a time where uh, individual, because of the mobile phone, and mobile phones are found everywhere, even in the most remote area around the world. And this may be one of the most interesting in terms of business the last 10 years, how much mobile phone have been able to be everywhere. But mobile phone also, in terms of attitude, brings individual much more than families or communities. That's individual connecting with what they want. They rate, they compare, they discuss. So you start to perceive that individuals are much more important than they were a few years ago. 
which means when you engage as a humanitarian organization, you don't engage anymore just with the leader of a community and everything, everything will be solved. No, no. It's all people are looking, watching. And I was happy that you mentioned that the Minister of Foreign Affairs feels also in, 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 uh, in Malaysia challenged by this new media and what it means as a politician. So fragmentation is there. Uh, and I think we need to capture that. And we feel it also as an organization when it comes also to government. Government are fragmented more and more. That's clear. A long, different perspective. And it's also real time. The fragmentation and the connections bring the notion of time much more shorter. When you are a government, you no, don't do any more policies for the next five years. Or maybe you do, but you act as if you have a policy for the next three months, right? Because you have to. You're under pressure. You have to change very quickly. So the notion of time is also changing. And we see that also in the military sector. The chain of command, not in the army, not in the official army, but the chain of command of changing also. If I look at non-state armed group, like the Taliban in Afghanistan, the Hamas or the Islamic State, the impression we have when we read the media is it's perfectly organized with the leadership and a chain of command which is extremely strict. This is not reality. It's much more complex, much more fragmented, much more difficult to grasp, which means for us as an organization, working in this environment, Engaging with all the stakeholders to make them understand what humanitarian action is. This is much more complex than it was a few years ago. When you would be able to talk to one leader and this person will give instructions and everybody will give instructions. This time is over and it's changing. And last but not least, when you look at a world connected but also fragmented, it has an impact on leadership. I don't know if you were watching around the world, I'm just wondering where is the next Nelson Mandela? Is there somewhere a leaders who can come, you know, above its country, about its community, to really bring us all together? There is none. At least not to my knowledge. Maybe the only one, I don't know if it's a leader, the only one is uh, Messi or, or Neymar, <laughs> uh, uh, that everybody knows, right? Uh, everybody will connect with them. Now, in terms of leadership, we can discuss, right? Uh, but it's something we have to reflect. Who are the leaders of today? of tomorrow, the real leaders, the one who will be able to bring us further than just our visions when it comes to country and, 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 um, and element. Fourth point, so I talk briefly about the complexity and talk about the political landscape, a world connected and fragmented. The fourth one, and you mentioned like Dr. Isai, the fourth point is trust. Trust is today becoming a very rare commodity. Everywhere. In school between us, in our families, in, of course, institutions. And if you look at all the surveys we see, all the surveys, without any exceptions, we see trust going down when it comes to institution, when it comes to the media, when it comes to leaders, when it comes to national political party, everywhere, including Malaysia. You're not immune. So we have to understand, if trust is a more rare community, what does that tell us? It will change the way you might an organization, you might an actors, but also diplomats, private sectors, will continue to relate to uh, the people we are trying to serve or assist. My last element is what I found the most striking over the last few years, and I think we have now an understanding more clear, is that nobody, no institution, no individual is immune from this trend. Wherever you are, you are feeling that much more. I can see that. Europe, for a long time, for example, thought that they were being new. They were looking at the questions of Middle East from far away, looking at the questions of migration from far away, looking at the question of the economic rising from far away. And suddenly they wake up in the morning, and the young people were doing rioting in Stockholm. The Swedes, I don't think they were ready for that. Right? As an example. So, so even Europe, even the rich country today, are in fact directly affected also by this kind of trend. So nobody is immune, including, by the way, humanitarian sectors. And Dr. Faisal, I could not agree more than what you said. The humanitarian sectors for a long time was living somewhere, loved, trusted by people. These days, we are challenged, rightly so, by people, and we are not immune from that. So. That are, we can have a long list, I'm sure, 
Um, I was just negotiating with Dr. Faisal, he could have five hours of discussion, he told me, no, 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 only four hours. <laughs> uh, I was like, done for five hours because there's so much to say, but let's focus on, 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 on some of the features. So that's, for me, maybe possibly the key features, which will define anyway what we're doing. So what is the way forward if you think about the humanitarian actors, especially willing to be as Mercy Malaysia, ICSC, or some of us here, being not only strong at home, but also very strong internationally. Being to be professional also, bring the best service possible. So what is our role, what is our space? I think the first thing for me, really, in terms of way forward, is I think we should be humble. Humble. Humble and stubborn. Maybe that's the new way, right? <laughs> Which means we should be humble in a sense, be aware that humanitarian response will not be the response to everything at all. We should be aware that the humanitarian response is an important one, absolutely no doubt on that. We should also be aware that the political response is critical and should be clear differentiation. I can tell you already, we can like it or not, but we as an organization, we collectively, we will not solve the problems of Iraq and Syria. We will provide assistance, try to protect people, and this is very important, let's do that well. But the solutions to Islamic State, for example, the solution of Iraq will be a political solution and a security solution, not a humanitarian solution. So we have to be humble. And I think we have also to be a little bit stubborn, which means we know it's a time of challenge, it's a complex time, so it's not time to complain. This is a world we're living in. So let's face it, and let's make something out of it. My second point in terms of way ahead, and this is something we really are experiencing at the ICS. It's the very strong ambition that we should maintain this ambition. And I think this ambition will challenge the United sectors. That we want to work in close proximity with people affected. In close proximity, really. We want to have direct access to people affected by war, by violence, by human humanitarian crisis, and not do that through partner. We want to do that with partner. We want to have our own staff being there. It's critical. It's fundamental. The close proximity is essential. And why I'm saying that? I'm saying that because the need of the people is evolving. They are complex. You need to capture that. You need to be with the communities, with the people, with them in order to be able to respond, not because you think that's the way, because you understand the coping mechanism, their resilience. People are smart. People are remarkably resilient. We need to be closer. We need to understand that. It's also the best way to be accountable when you're close to people, right? And that's a critical one. We need also to be close to people, because I think as a humanitarian organization, we should have this double ambition. This is the ambition of the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is on one hand, assist the people, yes, very important, health, food security, mental health, for example, but also at the same time to try to protect the people. And this is what is interesting, is the assistance and the protection which is so important. But to do that, you have to be there. You cannot just outsource your presence to <coughs> local people. They do their job. I mean, a local response is critical. But what I'm saying is local with an international dimension together, but also together taking risk. It's a time, ladies and gentlemen, where humanitarian have to take more risk. I'm not saying now dying, we're not looking for mafia, that's not what I'm saying, but possibly more risk, more financial risk, more political risk. We need to generate more support, but also, yes, as a person, make sure that we are there closely related, in close proximity with people. Last but not least, when I talk close proximity, it's possibly our own legitimacy to engage also government, but also non-state armed group, who are controlling this movement. How do you think it's possible for an organization like the ICSC to be able today to talk to a group as difficult like Islamic State? And we have to do that. We do have to engage them, not because we think it's important, because we agree, not, but because you have to understand, when we talk about the Islamic State right now in, Afghan, in uh, Iraq and in, uh, in Syria, we are talking not only about a group, we are also talking about 10 million people being under the leadership or under the control 
of this group. So what does that mean? How do we reach these 10 million people? How do we take care of them? Or at least we look at the humanitarian means when it comes to health, when it comes to protection. So you have to engage them. You have to find. And the only way to do that is to be close to the people. It's to have this legitimacy to be there, to be trying to assist, protect, and engage. This is our experience. And of course, people who watch, if you're there, if you're serious, if you're committed, even if they don't like you, at the end of the day, the communities, the people, they know if you've been with, you, with them or not. They will know. ICS is now 35 years of constant presence in Iraq. It comes. People will remember. Our memory is a very short memory, but the memory of the people is longer. So close proximity, taking the risk to be with the people. The third point, and this is something we have spoke quite a lot with Dr. Faisal and myself, um, including when we look at the humanitarian sectors, our colleagues from the UN, and what we feel. There is something that we feel that possibly we have to radically rethink, or being at least ready to rethink the relationship with the people affected and people who so-called, we call it, our beneficiaries. I think the people who are benefiting from our services are more and more in a situation to look at us as service provider. And it's difficult to accept that if you are the Red Cross, if you are Mercy Malaysia, if you are Humanitarian, you think, no, we are, we are there, we are pro proposing something interesting. But people are more and more looking at us as service provider. And they're comparing. They're using their phone to look at what we're doing. They, is, they are rating us. I always give this anecdote that happened very recently to some of my colleagues. Two days before Ayan hit it, Philippines, two days before there was another typhoon, smaller, who hit it, Somalia, two days before. Quite, a, quite an important structure. Nothing to compare with Philippines, but still, for the people, very difficult. We have people in Somalia working together with the Somali Red Crescent. It took us four days to cross from Magadishio to go to the places where, in fact, the typhoon hit it. When we arrived, when my colleagues arrived, they were welcomed by a community of women. No warlord, women. Right? And they looked at my colleagues and they were not impressed at all. They said, you are late. <laughs> late? Four days in Somalia? You know, crossing, taking risks, going there. They took their mobile phone and said, it took you one day to respond to Philippines and four days to us. And then they look at the hospital that ICSC together with our colleagues from the Red Crescent were providing, and they said, this is, a, this is, this is all a very small hospital compared to what you've done in Philippines now. Yes. And this is the reality in which we operate. At the same time, complex, engaging, very difficult actors, discussing with government, no sit down group, but also at the same time, having people more and more looking at us as service provider thinking that what is important is not because we are the Red Cross, the ICSC, or the Red Crescent, but it's what we provide and how much we are relevant. Be aware of that. We always forget that most of the community, they are these days connected. You know, people are everywhere. Migrants are everywhere. They are, you know, connecting for the, for the good, but also sometimes for the complexity. We have to understand that. Radically rethink how much our service will be, are already, but will be even more shaped by people. I'm of the opinion, some of my colleagues disagree with me, but I'm of the opinion that we will see in the coming years something as new than TripAdvisor. Do you know TripAdvisor? Yes, you know that very well. Okay. TripAdvisor have dramatically changed the business of restaurant and hotel industry over the last five years. If we would be together, uh, let's imagine in a restaurant or, or an hotel business, we would discuss five years ago about how will you control and influence Lonely Planet. Uh, which was all the Guide Michelin were very important in terms of bringing the people to the right way. Today, over. TripAdvisor comes for 95% of decision for of people when it comes to internationally going to a place to another. Critical. Tomorrow, maybe TripAdvisor will come to us. And not only to us, maybe to you, diplomat. Maybe to you, government. Not just people going led like that, but having possibly platform where people will judge, you know? Maybe at the end of this conference, they will tell us two stars only. Conference out of time, five. It was not good. Too long. Okay. Uh, but we'll have to see that. But it will come more and more. It will be rather challenging. My last comment, 
um, or maybe my, you know, okay, one of my last comments, okay, let's go for it, uh, would be about the fact that we, I think 